Hello, this is Mike again from Scratch, and welcome to a completely new, probably going to be series on the uh, building blocks of game development. We're looking at very nuts and bolts stuff right now. We're looking at things like uh, algorithms, design patterns, that kind of stuff. Um, and we're going to try and do it in a, a language, for the most part, and game engine for sure agnostic way. So today our example is going to be in C Sharp, but if you're familiar with C++, JavaScript, uh, Java, etc., the code should be easily adaptable to your language of choice. And what we're looking at today is a key concept in game development, but one that's pretty simple actually is the finite state machine. Now, it sounds a lot scarier than it is, and it is one of those things if you're going to do a game of any complexity, you're going to eventually create a finite state machine or finite state automata, I believe is the other name you'll hear for it. And again, it's scarier than it is. So I'll start off with a direct real world example of a finite state machine. And this is what we're actually gonna implement in code, but in a way that you'd see how it'd be useful to a game. And this is a finite state machine. And what it means basically is it has a state, one state, only one state, key concept there. So at any particular time, a traffic light is either um, red, yellow, or green. So you, know, so you either go, caution, or stop. That's the three states of that machine. Now, finite kicks in here as well. So finite means there's a finite number of states. So basically you have one value that is active at a given time out of a limited set of values. So for example, a light switch is a finite state machine. It's got two positions, on and off, and at any given time, it is always one of those two things. However, you could argue that a dimmer switch is not, because there is an infinite number of different values between on and off available there. So a finite state machine is simply defined as a data structure that has a value at all times out of a finite set of values. So only one value, and a, an an infinite number of values, not an infinite number. So that is a finite state machine. And as I said, a uh, traffic light is an example of a finite state machine. Now, if you're here obviously as a game programmer, so you probably wanna know what they're used for in games. Well, there's a couple of uses, but the biggest one, hands down, is AI. Artificial intelligence is built around finite state machines. It is just the core of it. And what you basically do there is you are normally in a task. So let's say um, Pac-Man's ghosts uh, might have a finite state machine controlling them and their given state at any particular time might be say, um, you know, fleeing, uh, waiting in their gated little area at the beginning, uh, attacking, uh, dead, etc. Those are all the various different states and those states will then control the artificial intelligence behind it. But that's not it. It's also used consistently for things like um, menu systems, um, world um, like status level events, etc. So finite state machines are critical to understanding. Uh, they're, they're a very critical game structure in game development. So let's jump right in and create one. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be using um, C Sharp for this example, just because. So hopefully the code is baseline enough. It'll make sense in any other language. If you do have some questions, do let me know. Um, and I'll try to adapt it to your language of choice. Now you'll notice here, I'm within the Patreon Dropbox site, so if you're a Patreon backer, this code example and project and all that are directly available in the folder Game Programming Fundamentals, which is where I'm gonna put all of these things, and then Finite State Machine. Now I'm gonna also create one of these on GameFromScratch.com, so you should be able to copy the code from there as well once I get that created. So I'm just gonna go ahead now and create my new project, so .NET new, and .NET Restore, and that'll grab all the dependencies I need for this guy. All right, and then finally code and open the current directory. Uh, let me bring my editor in from off screen. Come on, editor. All right, so we will bring in all the assets we need. Let it do its magic. And we're gonna keep it all in one single file here. Now let's start off with probably the simple example of a finite state machine. And this is gonna be a little underwhelming, uh, but meh, it gives you the basics of what we're dealing with. So let's create a new class here. So public class, and we're gonna create a digital traffic light in this example. So create a new traffic light. Inside of traffic night, we're gonna create public enum. Now enum should be available in every single programming language, but basically it is a data structure with uh, multiple options with only one of them can be active. If that sounds a bit like a state machine, hey, you got it. Uh, so we're gonna call this states, and the various different states we're going to have are green, yellow, 
and red. And to be honest, uh, we could end there. Uh, essentially, that is a state machine. Um, it, it's a very boring state machine. It doesn't do a lot for us, and it doesn't make for a very good tutorial. But you could argue that every enum is a state machine. There's no logic attached to them, though. Uh, so let's actually add a little bit more logic here. Um, now, first off, we'll create our constructor. We're going to do this in kind of phases. We're going to keep adding a little bit more functionality to our, our uh, traffic light over time. So first off, let's create a constructor, traffic light. Okay. And inside of our constructor, we're just going to go ahead and, oh, I didn't create our state. Sorry, my bad. So we created a type of enum. Let's actually create an instance of it. Um, so this is where we're going to hold our actual state value. For member variables, I often prefix them with an underscore. Uh, it means it's uh, private and internal variable. Uh, everyone uses different naming conventions. So if you hate that, there's only reason I'm doing that is it's actually my convention. Um, it's a very common convention, but state equals, so we'll just give it an initial state. So we're going to start off, we're going to create our traffic light is going to start off as green because nobody likes waiting for traffic lights. So states.green like so. And now that we have our state defined, oh, here, let me just sec. Sorry, that's probably a little bit easier to read. Okay, right. so now that our state is defined, I'm just going to go ahead and do a quick print out. So we've got some, let's just call it feedback in our uh, system.console.write line uh, light created with initial green state. So basically when our object is created, we're just gonna print that variable out. So down here, we'll get rid of our hello world. And instead what we'll do is go uh, traffic light, light equals new traffic light. All right, so let's just make sure that we've got everything up and going. We'll go ahead and run this. There you go. So in the midst of all this other gibberish, you can see light created with initial green state. So what we've done is we've, we've created the state as a private um, enum within our class, and we gave it the initial value of green. Now that's not really all that special because, well, it doesn't really do anything. So now let's go about and actually change it around. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hook it up to a timer, and this is gonna be a little bit ugly. This is gonna be the ugliest code here because it's part of the .NET Core uh, way of doing timers. So system threading timer and again it's private so I'm going to use an underscore prefix um, and when did I actually use my timer I create it in the constructor so right after we create what we're going to want to do is basically uh, change our light every few seconds now and speaking of seconds uh, private const int light duration so our lights are going to last 3,000 milliseconds or three seconds a piece and so that's what we want to do is every time that happens we're going to want to change our light now to change our light we're also going to need a method so public vo oh, actually that's the wrong method uh, da, 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 da. why did I call you public all right public avoid light changed. So actually should probably be private. I'm going to probably come back and change that later on. So basically every 10 seconds, we want to go ahead and change the light. And that's it. So it's just like when you're dealing with the traffic light in the real world, over a period of time, it's going to change. So that's what we're going to use this timer to do. And now after we have just created our state, we'll go ahead and create a timer equals new system dot Threading the timer and the callback is simply going to be to call our light changed method. So basically we're just creating a lambda function that we're passing in there and all it's going to do is call this method when this timer basically does its thing. And how long to wait? Threading that time, that time out, that infinite. All right. 
So basically this creates a new timer. Now you can get a lot more details about .NET timers in the .NET documentation. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of you know specification of exactly what I'm calling here, but just think of this code, or if you're gonna adapt it to your program language of choice, use whatever your native timer is and do a callback to uh, this particular thing. So this is the same as if you're working in JavaScript, you do a set timeout, for example. Uh, in uh, C-sharp 14, they've changed it. I forget what they're called. It used to be you use a function pointer, but now actually callbacks are built in. And um, anonymous function or Lambda functions are also built into C++ now. So you can almost translate this code directly into C++ as well. Uh, so that's what we've done. We've created this new timer that basically after three seconds, goes, it's going to kick off and call this method. So we now should probably do something with this method. And this is where we change the light value. So first off, let's console.write line light change. And now is where we're going to toggle between the various different states. And the easiest way to probably do this is with a switch statement. Yeah, switch statements, I believe, are available in just about every single modern language nowadays. So this should be easily adaptable. Uh, so case states, uh, states, states dot green. So if it's a green light, then state equals states dot yellow. So if it's green, switch to yellow. States, apparently I have trouble spelling this word. If it's yellow, We switch to red, just like a real world light. And let's go your country does these things different than in Canada. Uh, and states dot red is green. All right, so that's gonna toggle between the various different, um, the different states. So this is what every three seconds we're gonna go to the next light in the, the cycle. Now, a lot of times, if you're working with the finite state machine, this is where the, the logic of your game is actually gonna go. So you would put, um, you know, your, uh, um, come on brain, work, uh, your game logic. So if your AI changed, what you would normally do is, you know, switch AI modes in whatever creature is controlled. If um, the, game over state changed, you would, you know, do your corresponding logic here. We're using a very, very, very simple example here, uh, but that's the idea behind examples, I suppose. All right, so that is going to switch between the various different states. Now you'll notice there is no default. That's because this is finite options. There is no extra. We're handling every single one here. Uh, but now what we just need to do is refire our timer. So timer dot change light duration system dot threading dot time out dot infinite. Okay, so that will just fire. So after this has been done, basically it will now call this function again. Uh, it's just basically resetting that timer. So it's gonna do its magic all over again in another three seconds. And that is kind of essentially a state machine. We'll go ahead and run that. And now we'll see the results here. Oops, that's not run, that's run. No errors, no warnings, woohoo. Oh, two warnings. Hmm. All right, come on, show me results. Oh, yeah, so my code immediately exits. Uh, so this is all nice thread safe code, uh, but the problem here is uh, our game starts, creates our traffic light, and then immediately exits. So we probably don't wanna do that. We're just gonna add in console can't spell today, read line. And this is just gonna basically keep our program running until the user presses a key, or enter, I suppose, with read line. Go ahead and run that. Show me my results, and there you're seeing. So our initial light was created with green state, so it came in uh, to the constructor right here and fired this code off. And then every three seconds, it's evaluating through this light changed callback for because of the timer. And that is a very typical style of finite state machine. Now where they become useful to games though, is when other objects can actually interact with them. So what you normally want to do is some kind of a callback so that you know we, we can tell the world that light. So if I'm a, a car object waiting for the traffic light object to change to the state that I want, well, I've got no mechanism for actually checking this. So now let's add that functionality in. In order to do that, now this is gonna be very language dependent. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm adding this to our traffic light class, uh, but, right, where's my traffic light class actually end? 
uh, timer there, there. All right, so to my traffic light class, I'm going to add a callback mechanism. Now callbacks are available and workable in every single programming language out there in some form. You can go back to C, you can use a function pointer that you pass in as a parameter and then you call it. Um, C plus, uh, sorry, C sharp has some very nice mechanisms in for dealing with callbacks. It's a combination of delegates and events. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. First off, we're gonna define a delegate. You can think of this kind of like a function pointer. Basically, this is um, what our event is going to return. Uh, and what it's going to return is a function that takes the parameter new state. So this is going to pass out to a function what our state value actually is. And now that we've got that, we're going to go ahead and actually create the event to go with it. So public event. Now the return type of said event is our state change result, and we'll call this guy on state change. So this is an event that's going to fire whenever the state changes. So basically, when this happens. Now, of course, we actually need to fire it when this happens. So what we do is at the very end of it, we'll go in here and go on state changed. And then as the parameter that it's expecting, we pass out the state like so. So now we've got the ability to actually monitor externally what our traffic light is doing. Now let's actually go ahead and actually do that. So down here in our code, so where we're actually in our, our main, in our, you know, the guts of our program. So here we created a traffic light and then we basically sit around and wait for our application to end. Well, somewhere in the middle now, let's go and add traffic light. Oh, sorry, light dot on state change. So we're adding an event handler to it. So plus equals, uh, and then we're doing this with a um, anonymous function. So uh, traffic states state. So that is the parameter. And when it gets called, console.write line state. There we go. We got enough brackets. Yes, I do. I just need one more semicolon. All right, so basically what's gonna happen is we just added to our traffic light an on state change event handler. So when the on state change event fires, this function is going to be called. That's essentially what an event handler is. And you can have multiple, which is how this plus equals works, which by the way, you should also get rid of them because you can memory leak uh, event handlers very easily in C sharp. Uh, but you'll see here that we added one uh, but the plus equals, and we're doing it again with the um, with a lambda function. So basically, this is saying this is creating an inline function. So we could have also done it as uh, you know public uh, void on change function traffic lights dot state. And done this code there and then just pass this guy in as well. So they both work. Uh, they're both options. I like this syntax and style. So that's what I've done. So basically this function is going to be called and the body of this function is simply that. So we're just going to write out this current state of our finite state machine. That's it. We're done. Now let's go ahead and run that. Hopefully I haven't made any errors. There you go. So you see, light is changed. Initial state of green, light changed yellow, light changed red, light changed green, light changed yellow, red, and it'll go on forever. So you just created your first useful, semi-useful finite state machine. Now this stuff, you build upon them. Like the concepts are very simple. Basically, you're built around some kind of a data structure like an enum, which holds uh, a single, active value out of a plethora but a finite number of choices and then you normally what you do is you build up some kind of a mechanism around it like this callback system we've just done so internally you have your logic so when states change that's all done internally to your state machine but you're also going to often want to hook up some kind of a system like this that is going to be called so other people can subscribe to your state machine and get results. It creates a state machine that is essentially a black box. So now, you know, you could change the internal logic however you want. And, you know, if I wanted to do it so that now traffic like changed every five seconds instead of every three seconds, 
Well, again, it's a black box, so I can come up here and just change that out to five, and our calling code doesn't change at all. It's exactly the same, but the way our game performs, obviously, is going to be different. So now we're gonna see our light was changed. We're gonna wait five seconds, and now you're gonna see we're gonna to switch to yellow. And then we'll wait another five seconds and we'll switch to red, etc. So that's the nice thing about black boxing a finite state. And this is the data structure, as I was saying earlier. It's fundamental to a lot of different things. And a lot of people will use a finite state machine for controlling uh, their game state. So you've got the game could be at main menu and then, um, let's see, or starting, main menu, playing, uh, game over screen, exit. Or it could be, as I said earlier, for AI, for controlling what current state the AI is in. It could be for uh, a role-playing game to, um, is this NPC currently hostile? Is this uh, town currently safe? And you know, if you wanna have multiple things that can check on that, that's where this delegate system comes in very nice. And it keeps things loosely coupled. So you can have a dependency on an object, but not have a dependency on the object's implementation, which is exactly what you're aiming to do. All right, so that's it. It's a very straightforward but important thing to know. I hope, uh, I know that the traffic light demonstration is somewhat contrived, but in essence, that is a fully fleshed out state machine with callbacks and everything else you will need. I hope you've got it percolating in your mind now how this is a useful data type uh, for game development. And as this series goes on, first off, let me know if you want me to create, keep creating these kind of uh, tutorials. Uh, I could cover, you know, future, you know, design patterns such as, uh, for example, the singleton, is it good, is it bad, etc. cetera. Uh, I could cover things like um, min-max algorithms or A-star pathfinding, that kind of stuff, just higher level concepts that are key to game development. Let me know if you want me to continue on this or if you want me to stick more to engine specific stuff. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did enjoy that, please do click like and subscribe. Definitely helps the channel out. And we do this kind of stuff all the time. And it's your feedback that determines what happens in the future. So I do hope you enjoyed this uh, particular tutorial and you want to see more in this kind of series. That's it. See you all later. Goodbye.